there's a lot of other ecosystems that are going to have their moment in the sun. And for a while last year, it felt like the game that everyone was going to play was like Solana was going to catch ETH. I think now the game that people are playing, at least like, you know, what I'm thinking from a venture perspective is like, shit, Solana's worth, you know, $50 billion. Like maybe funding some of the other alt L1s or alt L2s, like they can, they can catch Solana. And so I think it's like, okay, cool. Like all the cake and punch and pie has been handed out. And now it's just like time to really build apps um, and prove that the monolithic thesis works. But yeah, you know, they've got like a great community of builders. So I don't think it's impossible. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Swell, a team leading the restaking future with their liquid restaking token, R-Suite. Now I've talked about liquid restaking on this program before. I think it is going to be a massive tectonic shift for Ethereum and I am super, super excited about it and I like the Swell team a lot. Goes without saying, do your own research. This is not financial advice. You guys all know the drill. Again, I like this team and if you stick around, I'm gonna describe how you can restake your ETH in Swell, earn pearls, eigenlayer points, and a whole bunch of future rewards. So thank you very much for Swell for making this episode possible. Hey everyone, wanted to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Flood Protocol, the optimal DEX aggregator. Now, if you are a listener of Bell Curve, you know that MEV is a massive problem, which is why we are so pumped to partner up with Flood on this season. Flood is the only gasless and MEV free aggregator that not only gets you the best execution, but also gives you back all the extra surplus that you create every single time you swap. Now, this is relevant for both swappers and developers, but you're going to be hearing all about them later in the program. So for now, thank you, Flood, and back to the show. Hey, everyone. Wanted to give a quick shout out to the Wormhole Foundation. If you are a Bell Curve listener, you know that transferring across chains can be a massive pain. I certainly do. I complain about it on this program all the time. That's why we are super pumped to have partnered with the Wormhole Foundation, the stewards of the Wormhole Protocol. The Wormhole Protocol connects over 30 blockchains and six different runtimes, including Solana, Sui, Ethereum, Layer 2s, and more. And the coolest part about this particular partnership is that they have made custom bell curve NFTs, which you can get and mint for free. You can claim that by just going down into the show notes and clicking on the link. All right, guys, on with the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Before we jump in, quick disclaimer, the views expressed by my co-host today are their personal views and they do not represent the views of any organization with which the co-hosts are associated with. Uh, Nothing in the episode is construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or other advice. You know the deal. Now let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another Bell Crew Roundup. You got me and Vance today holding down the fort. What's up, buddy? Chilling, just uh, just woke up. What about you? Yeah, you've got that fresh out of bed, uh, quaffed, quaffed look going on with the hair for yeah. folks who are not following all the video. Yeah, my hair is getting bigger and bigger. I'm going to have to make a decision here at some point whether to... It's well, going up. Well, it's going up. I mean, most bull runs, I have really long hair. So, you know, let's see. Nice. That could be the new indicator. We can just check how long Vance's hair is uh, tell where we are in the cycle. Um all right, let's slowly fire right into the uh, ETF. So I'll, I'll pull up the latest figures here, but let me summarize where I kind of think we are, and then you tell me whether or not you agree. I think, uh, obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, in the short run, it turned out that the ETF was a little bit of a sell the news event. Uh, the day of the, the listing, Bitcoin ran up to 49K or something like that and sold off back to 39. And I think there was a lot of emphasis there first, just on a lot of uh, the way the market was positioned leading in, either from CME futures or whatever, people were positioned very bullishly. But also people got very myopically focused, I would say, on the GBTC outflows. And for the first uh, five or six days, GBTC was seeing pretty steady outflows of you know between 450 to sort of 600 million, call it. But now you know where we are today is that those outflows are starting to slow down. So I think the last day's outflows on record was like 221 million. And we're back to the rest of the ETF complex saw a net inflows of 247 million. And you're actually starting to see uh, IBIT, I think, catch up to GBTC in terms of trading volume. So Vance, where do you, what do you sort of think about the, um, the state of the ETFs at the current moment? So just, you know, doing a little math. So let's say that, you know, we had yesterday 247 million of net inflows, um, including GBTC. And like, you can make the argument that the GBTC outflows are going to kind of taper off, but let's just, let's just stick with 247 million of net net inflows. And 
you know, like I think there's an argument that maybe it's like lower than that on like a go forward normalized basis. But I also think like as the price goes up, these things become self-marketing and a lot of the marketing and sales have not even really started yet at these big distributors, BlackRock, you know, Arc, uh, Bitwise, all those guys. So 247 million annualized that that's 59 billion net flows over the rest of 2024. That's like hugely bullish. I mean, just to give you an example of, of what that is in, in BTC terms, that's like every three days. Um, yeah, this is great. Every, every three days or so, you know, they're putting about, you know, 10 K BTC into these ETFs. And if you look at like, you know, how much Bitcoin kind of trades and it is not either lost or, or just being hodled by, you know, the true believers, there's about 1.8 million Bitcoin, um, that are like available for sale roughly, you know, you're looking at like within the next one to three years, like all of that Bitcoin kind of being bought up. So like, this is like hugely bullish in my mind. Um, and one of the guys that I've been watching, um, is Fred Krueger. I don't know if you've seen this guy. Um, but like this dude is like this old TradFi guy who's now kind of like found religion on Bitcoin. And I know. most most nights he'll like <clears throat> put on like a, you know, an expensive Italian jacket, rip a cigar, and uh, he has his dog there and he just basically waxes poetic about how Bitcoin's going to a million. Like the trad the TradFi moon boys are here. And um, it seems like they really like crypto. Uh, and so, like, you know, I think you've had all of the calling cards of, like, you know, Jim Cramer said Bitcoin's going to 30K. You know, you had other <laughs> people saying it's going to, like, 25K. And Jim Bianco is saying it's, like, you know, potentially dead forever. I just don't think there's anything further from the truth than that. Yeah. I completely agree with you. I also would just even add to that analysis of flows. You know, keep in mind that we've got the halving coming in April, which I'm pretty sure I saw... Matt Hogan tweet out that's roughly equivalent to seven billion dollars worth of supply getting wiped out. So I feel like the supply di di uh, the supply and demand dynamics for Bitcoin have basically never looked better. And you're start you've already started to see the outflows from GBTC getting neutralized. And I mean, where do you think Vance? Just if you had to put a number on it, like where do you think these outflows ultimately get to in terms of GBTC? It's, I think they started with somewhere around twenty five billion and. AUM, which is a pretty unprecedented head start for an ETF, especially with nine other ones launching. They've had, we're, we're looking at the flows here. So total over 14 days, they've had 5.6 flow out so far. Where do you think that ultimately winds up? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, um, I would, my, my personal theory at least is like you can, there's different types of, uh, you know, GBTC outflows, like the initial few, first few days where the outflows were very like chunky, like those are just like net sales. That's the FTX estate getting to cash to distribute. That's Grayscale selling GBTC to kind of re-collateralize their balance sheet and, <clears throat> you know, pay off whoever they need to pay off, like in terms of Gemini or any of the stuff that was going on there. I think the outflows of GBTC right now are more kind of like neutral to price uh, just because a lot of them, in my understanding, are ARBs like CME is still trading at a premium. And so there is an ARB there that where, you know, you're, you're, you're buying the futures and you're, and you're selling the spot. Um, and that's kind of like unwinding that is more neutral to the price than just straight up sales. And so, um, I think you're going to see that pace tapering off. It's like kind of like 180 million to 200 million about flows per day. And I think you'll see that taper off pretty dramatically. Um, but like, you know, I expect BlackRock to be the biggest ETF for Bitcoin in the world. And so, <clears throat> you know, if you think there's going to be 50 billion of net flows into these things in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, I think it's a pretty reasonable assumption that GBTC is probably like a distant number two, maybe has like 20 or 30% of the AUM of something like the IBIT, which is the BlackRock um, Bitcoin trust. Yeah, I... Uh... My thought was just looking at it, obviously completely unscientific, but I was sort of budgeting it about 30% of their AUM would just exit from GBTC. So I was always kind of looking for like seven and a half billion or something like that to flow out. We'll see if that ends up being accurate or not. One, one question that I had for you, I was trying to think this through myself, and maybe this can lead into the discussion of the ETH ETF as well, but I sort of do wonder 
you know, the, the ETFs, what they should have is a vol dampening effect, uh, right? For a couple of different reasons, because one, if we make the assumption that now the dominant way that um, Bitcoin and eventually ETH are going to attract flows is through these ETFs, then that changes the dynamic of kind of this very pro-cyclical retail driven, um, these very pro-cyclical retail driven flows to one which is much more institutional and one, more, one much more passive. And, you know, all the, the vehicle for buying it is just much more efficient than it's been in the past. And I've, I'm kind of just wondering like what the longer term implications of that are. Um, I, because all of the, even like altcoins are heavily correlated to the price of Bitcoin and ETH. And if Bitcoin's buyers and the source of their flows has changed this structurally and it ends up being less volatile, then I wonder if this is kind of not the beginning of the end, but this ultimately has a much, has a pretty significant impact on, um, the cyclicality of crypto in general. What are your, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, Look, I, I just don't think there's enough supply of coins. Like, I don't think there's enough coins for it to become muted from a volatility perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you think of, like, I have a lot of friends who work at some of the bigger hedge funds in New York um, in the world, and a lot of their strategies <clears throat> are, I mean, it's not just this, but one strategy is, you know, they love things where the float is relatively kind of cornered. And the other one is momentum-based. So, like, if something's working, they allocate more and more capital to that. Uh, and it, I, you know, it seems silly, but like, think of like, you know, all of the, uh, the meme stocks and, and, and the funds kind of getting in on that. I think, you know, crypto is, is obviously not a meme, but it has some of the same properties of like, it's a highly retail oriented market. Um, there is not a lot of float and these things are highly susceptible to momentum. And mm -hmm. as I think about like the bull run and, you know, where the market's at and all that stuff, like the euphoria and like the like the float being really dramatically reduced doesn't really kick in until new all-time highs. These yeah. things are again like self-marketing. And so I think you're going to see a lot of trad five participation in the upside that it's going to drive a lot of volatility. I also think like when the cycle is over and, you know, who knows, I think there's a lot of time between <clears throat> now and then, and, you know, we're going to drive interest rates to zero. And then, you know, at some point, you know, maybe we'll drive them back up and maybe that's in like four or five years and the cycle's over. Like you're going to see trad five shorting this. Um, on the way down. And so I, I think there's going to be more volatility, not less. Um, but like, you know, if there's 250 million of buying pressure every day, uh, like I think the the main price action is just going to be drifting upwards. I That's what I was sort of wondering. I, I think there are strong, I agree with everything you said. And I also do think this is a prediction that keeps getting proven wrong. Every cycle, you know, someone comes out and says, we have a much more, that's what people said in 2021. They were like, we have derivatives now. There's much more institutional money. These crazy cycles that we've been through in the past are not going to manifest again. And obviously that was just dead wrong. So yeah, that, that, and that, and the, like, you know, ever since I got into crypto, I've been hearing that the markets are going to get less volatile. And like, there's also a price that Bitcoin will get to where it'll just be stable. I don't think crypto works like that. Where it's like, you know, we drive Bitcoin to a million and then it just stays there forever. Like may yeah. maybe. Um yeah. so I I just don't really believe that. Yeah. I I I'm with you too. I, I think where where my head was at was it's kind of like in past cycles, the next incremental dollar that was coming in was from some retail person, which makes crypto much more susceptible to momentum style trading whereas now the next incremental dollar at least for the majors is looking like it's going to be passive and you know there are when you when when you have mar macro and much more uh, traditional investors in the driving driver's seat then they're less likely to like buy breakout trends they'll like short they're kind of like mean reverters and no no that's the opposite of what they do really most of them like most of the big pod shops are momentum hmm like, Interesting. like to the extent that when, you know, PMs, uh, like, uh, I can't name names or sectors, but like, um, you know, say you're, you're long something and it goes up two X as a PM, you're like time to cut, you know, my bonus is in jeopardy, you know, it's looking good for this year. And in the reality, they're like, you know, cause the pods allocate you capital like a, like a millennium yeah. or a Ballyasney or a Citadel, 
they're like, no, you're putting more on and you're not going to cut. <laughs> and, and like, That's... you know, look at, look at gold, you know, it was a retail oriented market was waiting for a spot ETF forever. You know, the ETF hits and the price skyrockets. Um, yeah. Like we, we have pretty good analogies here as to what's going to happen. Also for listeners who might not be familiar with this pod model that you're talking about is kind of like this has become popular in recent years for hedge funds, but it's basically like find some young portfolio manager. The value proposition is instead of going to open up your own shop where you have to set up all of this infrastructure, it's like we are going to basically provide you this infrastructure that you can just plug into. We're going to have more granularity about like how much money gets allocated to you and stuff like that. But that's right. When you've described the pod model, that's basically what you're we talking about. Yeah, exactly. And you yeah. know, the things that are in your control are what stocks you're selecting. Um, but what's not in your control is like, they will allocate you more capital and they will kind of, you have to put it to work in the existing portfolio that you have. Um, so it'll, it'll be really interesting. Um, I just don't like, you know, the, the sell the news crowd, I just think is very wrong. And like, you know, all things considered, was it a sell the news event? Yeah, I guess. But like, we're 10% off where we were. GBTC has been completely cleared out. Celsius has been completely cleared out. Um, the FTX estate has been completely cleared out. Like, I don't know. Like, what, what, are, we, what are we doing here? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about the ETH ETF. So we had Standard Chartered actually came out and talked a little bit about this in a pretty bullish way. Standard Chartered is one of the larger, sorry, investment banks that's based out of Europe. And they came out this week and said that they think it's pretty likely that we're going to get an ETH ETF by on May 23rd. Um, so yeah, I, I would love, Vance, if you could just kind of sum up for listeners who might not be as familiar with the some of the maybe specific challenges to an ETH ETF, like how likely it is and what do you think about Standard Chartered coming out and talking about this? Yeah, so I, I think the people who know this best are... A, Eric Balchunas and James Seifert, who've been like the ETF Sherpas for the whole industry for, um, you know, the the entire Bitcoin ETF. And they have it at about 60, 40 for, for May. And May is the date where kind of most of these filings are due to be ruled on by the SEC. Um, and if they do not rule on them, you know, assume that they will be sued and taken to court in the same way that GBTC was, or, or yeah, Grayscale was, um, or, or actually sued the SEC. Um, and so whether it's May or May plus like two or three months, uh, it seems like at least I'm pretty high confidence that the ETF is going to come probably this year, you know, maybe in the second half, but I would say like, I'm more confident in the first half. Like, I, I think the standard chartered, uh, analysis is right. Like you, it, like Scott Johnson, who's another guy on crypto Twitter, who's like ETF pilled and, and super into it. Um, he said that analysis is pretty service level and there's like other things that like potentially could mean that they need to go to court versus like an outright approval. But like, the, you know, this ETF is coming. Um, and, you know, if you think $250 million a day for Bitcoin is a lot, like it, it kind of boggles the mind what could happen if an ETH ETF gets approved, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the heat of a bull run. I think beyond that, you know, you need a futures ETF product um, in order to have a spot ETF product. And that's probably going to be another, like it, were, it, were, it would require an administration change in our view to have other ETFs. And um, I think that's going to be a big demarcation between Bitcoin and ETF and the rest of the field. Like if you don't have um, an ETF, like sure, a rising tide lifts all boats, but like the liquidity you're going to get on these things is pretty incredible and it's going to invite TradFi in. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty high conviction that we have one this year. Uh, but you know, like the, the other side of the coin is like JP Morgan doesn't think we're going to get one. And that is basically, I thought like even more surface level analysis of just like Gensler doesn't like ETH. Um, I don't think that ultimately holds much water in the face of what we've seen the courts do to the SEC. Vance, what do you think about the possibility of, like, is this e ETF, if we get it, is it going to be yield bearing or no? Like, is it going to include stake yield? No. And I, I think that's actually, if you think about it, um, all of the people who are not staking are subsidized those who are in terms of like the additional yield that they get. Um, and so that's like kind of marginally bullish, like Lido and like, 
you know, the crypto native staking providers, um, because I think it's going to be a while until the SEC gets comfortable with like, we're locking the assets in this trust in a smart contract that could be slashed. Yeah, I think it, I had never really thought about it until just this moment, but the, an ETH ETF, which can only hold spot ETH is sort of a nice counterbalance to what's going on in the ecosystem right now, which is this idea that, hey, like if I could either hold ETH or I could hold yield bearing ETH in the form of Steeth. Um, and I think there's been a little bit of concern about that, like pretty, pretty uh, understandable concern. And if there was an ETF, which was basically a massive buying source just for the spot ETH ETF, that could actually like oddly solve some some issues uh, in the current moment. So that would be kind of a yeah. Answer. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I don't. I, it's. Uh, I, I think it solves a lot of problems for ETH. Um, well, not a lot of problems, like. It just helps subsidize the yield, and it gives just a different persona of you know ETH, which is really kind of what you want. You don't want it all staked, ideally, or if you do, like weird things could happen to the price. Like if we get to like seventy or eighty percent staking rate, like Cosmos and ETH, um, there's just not going to be a lot of coins. Yeah, and I think also from the perspective of ETH, the protocol, it's like you want to preserve. The moneyness of ETH, the asset itself, and you know, Steeth is actually, you know, it's a it's essentially like a receipt from the staking pool operator, which is Lido, and uh, you know, you're taking on certain assurances. It's a little bit centralizing to the protocol potentially, and you're taking on the trust assurances of Lido as opposed to ETH directly. I, I'm in the camp that like most ETH is going to end up getting wrapped eventually, mm -hmm. anyway. But uh, and I'm a huge fan of Lido. I like I get why that. Some people in the Ethereum community are concerned. I'd also put myself like hardcore in the pro Lido camp. Like I really like Lido. So I don't know. I just think a little bit of incremental demand for like pure spot ETH would almost be like a nice boon to the state of the ecosystem right now. So just an interesting dynamic and thought of before. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Swell, a liquid restaking protocol and the issuer of the R Suite liquid restaking token. Now, if you're a listener of Bell Curve, you know that I am just so fascinated by restaking and liquid restaking. I think it is going to be one of the most important trends in Ethereum, and I am really excited for the benefit that it unlocks both users and also Ethereum, the protocol itself. Now, disclaimer, whenever there's yield involved in a product, do your own research. This is not financial advice. You guys know the drill, but Swell is a great team. They have a non-custodial product, and they are mission-driven on giving you the best liquid staking experience. If you take one benefit away from using liquid restaking, make it be capital efficiency. Now you can earn passive yield from Ethereum. You can earn yield from multiple actively validated services that stack on top of that. And then you can still use our suite as collateral in DeFi. And because I know y'all are a bunch of DGENs, there's a points angle here as well. But in Swell, we call them pearls. So pearls equal points. And if you stake your ETH with Swell, you can earn pearls and future eigenlayer rewards. And when there's a token generation event, you can swap your pearls for Swell tokens. Head over, click the link at the bottom of this episode. Again, just pause what you're doing right now. Go click the link at the bottom of this episode. Check out Swell. Thank you later. Vance, I want to get your thoughts on some uh, some of the new innovations that's happening in kind of consumer use cases for crypto. So we had, uh, there's been a lot of talk on poly market, and I want to get your thought on predictions markets uh, in a second here. But thought one thing that I have actually been pretty interested in this week was Farcaster Frames. I'm not sure if you saw that. Um, yep. But yeah, could you, could you for, uh, for listeners, just give an overview of what is what are Farcaster frames in general and why are people kind of excited about them? Can, can you do it? I'm, I'm probably not the best person. I've been, I've devoted my time on playing around on poly market the past couple weeks. I've yeah. I, let me start with the, let me start with the problem statement for, for, for block works for like media companies. I, this has been the first time that I've looked at something like kind of someone messing around with crypto stuff and been like, I can not only squint at this, but look at this and see that this solves a problem that BlockWorks has as an organization. So one of the problems with more traditional like media companies right now is that they lost access to distribution. So like web to, you know, social platforms, they have, they have the audience right now and they're becoming, they have leverage over, you know, media companies, publishers that actually produce content and they're squeezing margin out of them and they're just making it like a less hospitable place to um acquire users and traffic like blockworks acquires 
uh, traffic through Twitter and Google. And you can see Elon Musk is like not making a, you know, he's being very direct about it. He's like, I don't want, uh, basically he's making Twitter less and less of a hospitable place for block works, which actually is a massive problem for us because our whole audience is on Twitter. Like that, that uh, kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm curious. That was what was behind. Remember when he changed, um, when you used to be able to show, like when you linked a news thing, yep. it said New York times title of the article. And he like ripped all that off. And it's literally just to make it less likely that people are going to click. And because the the business model of Twitter is like, he doesn't want you going to the New York Times. Elon Musk wants you staying on Twitter, right? Like that's his objective there. And so there's this, there's this in, uh, incentive mismatch. And what Farcaster Frames allows you to do is on their platform, they're basically saying they're, they're making it super easy for you either as a media publisher or an NFT platform or whatever to just embed this action on Farcaster. But unlike Twitter, which is like trying to get you to not go somewhere else, you can just immediately like mint an NFT directly from Farcaster. You can subscribe to a newsletter directly from Farcaster. And right there, that makes that a super attractive value proposition from the perspective of Blockworks, because right now to acquire like a user on X, A, X is making it less attractive from, you know, just displaying an article. You know, when you click through, it doesn't take you to the actual site, it takes you to this bullshit AMP thing, which is a really shitty user experience for the reader. Like they're actively trying to do that because they're trying to keep you on the platform. And Farcaster has kind of gone the other way and said, we want to be super modular. And if you were like a publisher on our site and they have a very broad definition of what a publisher could be, it could be content, you could be writing your own newsletter, you could be publishing an NFT. We want to make it super easy for you to do that. And that to me, I was just like, wow. That is such a powerful idea. And it's so powerful. I literally look at this being like, Blockworks should be leaning into Farcaster right now. So props to Dan Romero and the team over there. I think it's super cool. I haven't had the chance to play around with it yet as much as I will, but I thought it was really innovative. Very cool idea. I mean, <clears throat> it also feels formative to the ETH narrative as well, where it's like, we've got our own community now. Um, and it's e easier to coordinate. It's less noisy, all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've played less with, for, with, around less with Farcaster, um, and it, it, all the points you made make sense. I, I do think if you take a step back and you think about like all of the crypto narratives that are happening right now, it's pretty wild. Like you've got Bitcoin and ETH, you know, ETF soon or, or, you know, already in place. You've got social starting to take off and like not just crypto people are on Farcaster. Like it's, it's like 15,000 DAU, but like it's growing pretty rapidly. You've got games launching, you know, immutable launch, there's ZK, ZK EVM. You've got DeFi scaling. Um, like I can kind of like see the headlines now in like a year's time when we break all time highs. And like, you know, there's like this diaspora of different narratives and use cases and things that have been built over the bear market. Um, it's really impressive and it's really positive for crypto. It's, so cool i right now there's obviously a lot it's of happening things. it's fine i know i know anyway shout out to dan romero and the team at farcaster i'm definitely going to check it out more and socialfy is one of those interesting things where and i want you to talk about polymarket but i feel like crypto should be highly disruptive to social media in a sense because the whole pro the reason it's difficult to compete with social media is they have network effects but that's what crypto is really good at solving cold start problems with tokens and breaking network effects. So I always kind of looked at social fi as like, okay, it feels like very primitive. You're literally competing with some of the largest, most well-run companies in the world that have extremely entrenched network effects. But I feel like crypto could be a really novel solution for how to compete. And I'm just rooting for Farcaster. I think frames are really cool. So yeah, people should check them out. Me too. I'm, root I'm rooting for everyone, you know? Yeah. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. Um, talk to us a little bit about Polymarket. I've seen that's been getting quite a bit of traction recently. I've just gotten interested in like prediction markets and political betting, and it's never really been liquid enough to really do anything interesting. So, all right. So, so these are the political betting odds for this year. Like, th this is just to give you an, an idea of like what these markets look like, and and you know, um. For predict it, which is historically, you know, one of the most cited, like, you know, you look at the, you go on, you listen to the news and they cite predicted odds. What's interesting about predicted is that you can only bet $150 or 
per person per market. And so like you get this like really weird skewed thing that doesn't really make a lot of sense that people cite as like a source of truth and, and that doesn't make much sense. And then you look at the other ones of these bet us, Bavada, B win, sporting bet, you know, basically if you call them up and you try to bet, um, on any market, they will screen you based on what you do for a living. You know, if you, if you work at a fund or you, you know, you're not like just purely retail, they're going to skew the odds and they'll only give you tiny size. Um, and so it's like, you know, for something that everyone cites and everyone believes in, like these markets are like a not functional and B just like not representative of, of really any sort of real betting interest. And like, you still see political candidates like tweet out these odds and tweet out, you know, how they're doing on the betting markets. Like it's extremely weird. So, so that's, that's one screen. Now I'm going to pull up poly market. Um, <laughs> poly market, there's $35 million or $34.4 million bet. And if you look at like, you know, like you buy yes or no on, on Trump odds or, you know, Biden odds or even Michelle Obama odds, like look at the midpoint here on a spread of one cent, there are, you know, what, 600 million of, of liquidity on the, on the buy side and, you know, 800 million on, on the sell side, like right at the midpoint of the market. It's extremely impressive and there's no incentives yeah. with this. It's grown 3x um, from about 10 million to 30, you know, 3 million, whatever it is today in the past three weeks. Like this market's only been live since the 1st of January. Um, and you have Donald Trump tweeting out his odds, you know, how he thinks he's doing and the poly market odds and all this stuff. And, you know, it's like pretty interesting. And I think the problem with prediction markets is like every four years, yes, like we want to bet on presidential markets. That's okay. Um, but what are the other things that you could do that could make this more interesting in the future? Like the things that I think of are like, you know, they have like markets on the Middle East. Will Hamas right, remain in power? Will the Houthis, um, you know, hit another U.S. ship with rockets? Um, you know, you, like you could build kind of like an interesting, like this is just spitballing, but like news betting site out of this. Like that's pretty interesting to me. Um, and most people, when they think of like, you know, what do you buy or sell if the Houthis, you know, ramp up their aggressive campaign in the Middle East, they're going to like, you know, buy oil or buy some derivative of that event happening. Like there is an argument to be made that like, if you can bet on the event directly, it's just like more interesting and more accurate. Um, the other things are like political outcomes in the Senate, the House, you know, all, all these different bills that are going to be passed. Like, I'm hoping that this is the cycle that we can break out a, just beyond presidential markets, um, even though those are kind of like far larger than they ever have been. Like, I, th I do think the presidential market on poly market will go to a billion in liquidity at some point this year. Um, mm -hmm. It's 30 million. It's the first of Feb and the elections in November. But like my hope is that that can be the starting point for this branching outwards. And I think there's other problems with prediction markets, like how loyal is liquidity, how proprietary is the site to people. But like Polymark has just been slowly grinding and it's just cool to see them them really do well. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think one of the other cool ways that I've seen it used and I think it would be useful even for block rocks. I found myself thinking about this when you were describing it is almost like if you could embed, you know, poly market odds on an article or something like that, where if you were covering right. the presidency, it's like, hey, look, and this is what betting. It's just another data point and visualization that you can use. And yeah, I think it's super cool. I think there are, you know, just to point out, there are some of the issues that people have raised around prediction markets in the past is like assassination markets. I think this actually ended up popping up on, what was that? Like the first prediction markets that rolled out. I, can't I, I know what you're saying, but like, yeah, come on. Yeah, I, I know. Well, I also, you know what? The other thing that you could think about prediction markets doing is, uh, you know, if they became deep and liquid enough is it actually lowers the friction for doing things like hedging. Like you could say like, I bet that it's going to rain. Like if you're, you know, a farmer in Argentina or something like that, you could have a prediction mark. Like, I think it's going to rain however many times this year. And that, and that's a way to hedge essentially your, your crops. Whereas right now that's not, a, that's not an issue. If you get like a large agricultural conglomerate or, you know, a sort of industrial farmer in the U S you can go to a bank and there are special banks that do that, but you don't have that option if you're, you know, in another part of the world or something like that. So yeah, you can actually look at prediction markets and see that they'd be really useful for 
like edging or lowering the frictions for creating super useful products like futures and uh, stuff like that. So I think they're super like, interesting. like, like, you know, having like, this is, this is just spitballing, but like if you merge like community notes with like a prediction market, yeah, you know, saying like, you know, uh, how much do you want to bet that this is right or wrong? Like that's probably a better economic incentive than just like, let's see what the peanut gallery thinks of, of this claim. Um, there's obviously problems of like re resolving these markets and poly market is built on the UMA Oracle. And, you know, p p that's like one kind of thing in the poly market community that like divides people. Some people think it's bad. Some people think it's good, but like there's no incentives going on in this market and there's a ton of volume and there's a ton of liquidity. Um, and I think it is a good omen for, for what's going to happen with these markets in the future, but like add it to the list of like expanding crypto narratives that are working. Yeah. I, Completely agree with that. Um, and I'm very curious to see what, so what are the, what is poly market pricing in, in terms of Trump? Is he, he's like, he's like 52 cents right now. So like slightly better than, you know, 50% odds, but like an, another, another market is the ETH ETF market. And it's at like slightly less than 50% odds that it gets approved. Uh, I think in late May, but like, you know, if you're bullish ETH and you think that ETF is going to prove, get approved, like you double your money if it does. Like yeah. it's arguably more efficient than betting on the underlying, which is, which is cool. Yeah. That point that you made too, about sometimes it, maybe it's just better that you could bet on the thing itself as opposed to a derivative of that. It's kind of like in, you know, what I would imagine, you know, to ver be really reductive about what it's like to be a hedge fund manager. It's like, okay, do I think this thing is going to happen? If this thing happens, then how do I express that trade? And those are, you know, you can actually sometimes get the thing right or, but express the trade incorrectly mm -hmm. and get screwed. So maybe this just obviates part of that, makes it a little easier to bet on the thing that you're actually trying to bet on, which is an interesting concept. So just want yeah. to underscore that. It, that. That's that's a great point. Like the two parts of you know trading are what is your idea and and how are you structuring it. Um, mm -hmm. Like a good example of this is like you know I've been I've been uh, doing some some personal research into like uranium and and I think it's interesting and like there's a whole thesis behind like nuclear and um, whatever. Right now, there's this, there's this, there's this bill in the house that would ban Russian uranium, and a lot of the uranium community is like, this is like going to be turbo bullish uranium, and it's going to go up a lot, and blah blah blah. It's like, if you have a view on the bill, like, and I, I like, I'm more, I'm more negative on the bill passing, just because like I think our government is a shit show, and like nothing's going to happen this year at all. Mm. I'd probably rather bet on the bill. Than like hold a bunch of like spot physical uranium trusts. It's just like a different way. It, it removes the last part of like, how do I structure this to your point, which is cool, which is half of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that eventually people will be able to take out leverage on prediction markets bets? It's like, that oh, the... oh, I think it'll happen. You know, yeah. we have a way of making these things happen. Just, Where there's a will, there's a way. Happen. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you on that. For better or right. for worse. All right, I want to, but I think in general, and actually maybe to tease a little bit about some of the stuff that Permissionless is going to focus on this year, I just think consumer use cases are something that this industry needs to see. And I do think if you take a second to look around, there are things that are working and are cool. So yeah, I think it's always just worth highlighting. Um, all right, next next topic here is uh, NFTs. So NFTs and asset class are seeing a little bit of a surge in interest. So um, we've got here via Coindex, uh, Jesus. Coindesk, uh, indexes that track the price of NFTs have risen almost 10% this month, and they're actually outpacing ETH. Um, so I guess, you know, we've talked a little bit about NFTs. NFTs were a big prediction of mine for this year. So I feel like, you know, disclaimer, I'm, I've been pretty bullish on them. But what are your sort of thoughts on how do you view NFTs as an investment in general? Like, do you think that is there real innovation going on in the model? Like our, our PFP, you know, 10,000 collection PFPs kind of dead moving forward. Um, and yeah, how would you just kind of slot them as an opportunity for investors out there listening? All right. So this is the, the all time price chart. And this goes back to August, 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and like the thing you have to remember about NFTs is that their bull run was incredibly gnarly in terms of how much price appreciation happened. It was also incredibly short. So, you know, the, the floor for CryptoPunks in August 6, 2021 was 32. And then it quadrupled 
uh, by October 2021 uh, to almost 115. Um, and then we had this huge drawdown, you know, I'm drawing the line in the chart and we bottomed at 40, uh, in July 6, 2023. That, that was like when the ETH identity crisis was in full swing as like Solana was ramping. Um, and now we're, you know, 50 plus percent higher than that 61. And so like crypto punks are unique in the sense that they're like, at least for me, a, a levered beta on ETH. Um, and they kind of represent like the coolness or confidence of the ecosystem. Um, I think everything else other than that has done pretty poorly other than like pudgy penguins, uh, mad lads on Solana, um, and maybe a few other kind of blue chip collections, but I don't see that there's new demand for 10 K PFP collections. And, you know, back in the day, these were really hard to make, but now that we have generative AI, it's like, you can crank out 10 K PFPs pretty easily. Um, and so I think like the market is solidifying in terms of there's probably 10 NFT blue chip assets that are going to be levered beta on the ecosystem that they're in, uh, or if they're creating their own ecosystem, just kind of their own thing. But my sense is that gaming NFTs are kind of like right around the corner. And like Pixels, um, who's a portfolio company of ours, has, you know, 200K DLA active wallets. Maybe like, you know, a third of those are bots uh, and it's on Ronin. Um, but, you know, they're generating, selling, distributing NFTs. And they're pretty low cost NFTs. They're like, you know, five to 10 bucks. But like, it feels like that's more of where the market is heading um, versus like these super expensive NFTs that that people kind of associate with different ecosystems. Yeah, me too. I, I think also there's a lot of room to play around with the business model of NFTs. And I think you're starting to see, like I've talked about it a lot on the show, but uh, what Luca is doing with Pudgy Penguins and basically slotting NFTs as sort of a, a value sink or a value accrual part of a very traditional sort of IP business, I feel like is really interesting. And that makes a lot much, a lot more sense to me than like the decentralized Disney thing that you, you used to hear, uh, you know, last cycle. You also see like Mad Lads, uh, with what Armani and Tristan are doing over with Backpack as kind of using an NFT collection as like, a revenue generation mechanism and community building thing um, as almost like top of funnel for a product. Uh, Tensorians have done that as well with Tensorians, the collection and Tensor, the exchange. I feel like they've su successfully experimented with that. And I, I do think there's even room to experiment, frankly, with just like gaming NFTs, I think are also super interesting. And I also think there's room to experiment just with like, does it need to be 10,000? Like how, like, I mean, can we do more or less or cheaper? Like, mint, like even um, the drip experiment that's going on uh, on Solana is super interesting. So I feel like there's a ton of room for innovation and there's always going to be a market out there for people that want cool art. Like ultimately I just see this as kind of like a mix of kind of like a mix of trading and art and yeah, it's kind of a left curve thesis, but I just think they're cool. And I think people are going to keep buying them. Is my, is my take on them. No, uh, look, uh, I'm glad that we've gotten the NFT community off the mat. They're, they're pretty destitute for a while, um, but they bring a lot of energy and, you know, creativity and, and good vibes to the space. So I'm, I'm happy to see all these NFTs do well. I agree. I also do think there is a cultural affiliation with NFTs. Like, just imagine for a second, punks moving off ETH, like how crazy that would be. And I think there were some NFT collections, like no judgment, but there were some NFT collections that moved ecosystems potentially for the wrong reasons and i think those are going to struggle to gain traction again because again nfts are really just an exercise in building community and if you like switch community it's kind of like a sports team moving cities or something like that it just it takes away from the depth i don't know i think it's i'm with you they're going to struggle. Hey everyone, wanted to give a quick shout out to the Wormhole Foundation. If you are a Bell Curve listener, you know that transferring across chains can be a massive pain. I certainly do. I complain about it on this program all the time. That's why we are super pumped to have partnered with the Wormhole Foundation, the stewards of the Wormhole Protocol. The Wormhole Protocol connects over 30 blockchains and six different runtimes, including Solana, Sui, Ethereum, Layer 2s, and more. And the coolest part about this particular partnership is that they have made custom Bell Curve NFTs which you can get and mint for free. You can claim that by just going down into the show notes and clicking on the link. All right, guys, on with the show. One thing that I wanted to actually call out here as well, uh, or another story for you, is we had the launch of STTIA today. So that comes from Stride Protocol. And I just want to call that out because I think liquid staking, you know, as you know, I know you guys are investors in Jito. 
Um, I also am, but I'm also just like a fan of the protocol. But I'm I'm fascinated by frankly Lido, Gido, and when I look out at the at the world of new ecosystems where a liquid staking token makes a lot of sense, I think Celestia is kind of the obvious play there. There's kind of this idea of modular money, and I think Celestia, like you can look at it and think it probably has a pretty similar design to Ethereum, where you know you've got a base layer which is minimally performant, um, actually. You know, Celestia is like much more bare bones even than Ethereum. It can't support smart contracts. But what it's trying to do is attract a whole bunch of rollups to build on it and to use uh, Tia, the token, for gas or as a form of money. So you can kind of think about Celestia as trying to export its dollars uh, or its its token up to the, the, the rollups that are going to use it. And... The, just because of the construction of Celestia today, it's like super minimal. They don't even have interchain accounts or anything like that. It's kind of tough to actually, like, what is the bridge that you're going to do that? And you can't support uh, export Celestia itself. It has to be a wrapped version of it. So STT is probably the best way of, of actually doing that. So Stride is rolling this out. Uh, everyone teased this, did a long interview with Aiden of Stride and uh, John Charbonneau, actually. This is going to be airing on Monday, which was a really fun episode, but... Uh, yeah, just I'm very interested to see the the penetration of liquid staking in the Celestia market. I think it could be a pretty large market and yeah, pretty pumped for stride overall. But what, what do you think, Vance, in, in general about Celestia as kind of an attractive market for liquid staking? And what do you think about this idea of modular money? Um, I, I, I think, I mean, modular money just seems like a meme to me, honestly, Um like like i say this is like we did the seed of, of celestia as well so like we we do have some bags there um look i i think it's like you know any asset can be staked and if the inflation rate is high enough um you're gonna have people you know be interested in it i think this the staking rate for celestia is 25 percent at the moment so it's like if you're not staking you're getting diluted so there's like a heavy incentive to do so um I think at the end of the day, you kind of do need to build real fees for liquid staking to really take off in a way that is meaningful, uh, or else everyone's just going to get diluted to, to zero. Um, and I think if you think about how Ethereum is constructed, like the fees are high on L1, that bootstraps the, you know, whatever, 35 million of, or maybe it's less than that, 30 million of ETH stake today. Everyone gets those fees, the supply decreases, everyone uses it as money, everyone denominates in it on the lending markets, on Maker, on Aave. Like that to me is more of a path um, to, you know, basically becoming money than just like liquid staking and here's some inflation. Like you need to get people to actually like denominate in it. You can't get people like the, I, I think like Celestia has a path to get there. Um, but like more of it is revol revolving around. You know, is it paired with main assets in liquidity pools when meme coins launch? Is it used as a lending market piece of collateral when you're borrowing money? Like, are you confident enough in the price to borrow, you know, half the value against it? Um, and so I think like these are good first steps for Celeste to be taking. I think, um, you know, inflation is vicious. It can like really eat away at your principal and it can cause all these weird externalities in the secondary market. Um, having liquid staking is amazing. I think the path to money for any asset, Sol, Tia, you know, Avalanche, whatever you want to call it, is like you need to get people to denominate in it. It's not just about like, oop, I have I had Tia, now I have like S Tia. Mm -hmm. That's like maybe the first inning of of getting there. Well, here's something to think about. I'd be I'd love to get your opinion on this. If you really think about it, bridges are kind of a myth in the sense that the native asset is never leaving the core protocol but you're exporting different wrap versions of it through various vehicles, like some of which have much better security assurances versus another. Like the Ethereum that you have on Arbitrum or Optimism is locked in a contract on main chain. And then there is like the kind of synthetic version that lives on Optimism or Arbitrum, but there's an extremely credible bridge. Um, there's like a canonical bridge which, which exports the ETH. So you're like very safe, but it's still like, you have to think about it in terms of physics, like the ETH itself is still on main chain. And so any asset that wants to be a money, you need to export, you know, you need to export some kind of wrapped version of that. And probably the best way to do that is through canonical, like roll up bridges on ETH. Um, probably the worst way to do it would be like a lot of the old 
uh, mint and lock bridges, a kind of third party bridge designs that you saw. And so then if the question is like, okay, if most of the money that is in existence is going to be wrapped, if it's going to be wrapped anyway, then why wouldn't you just have the yield bearing version of that that's wrapped? And then oh. I think the other, and then I think the other thing that is, is just an interesting, I don't really know how protocols are going to compete on this, but how does like, if you were just imagine Vance, you were like unilaterally Ethereum or unilaterally Celestia and you were like, all right, my asset can't leave my protocol, but I want to incentivize these rollups to use my asset. Like what is the playbook for doing that? Because I think historically people had thought about that. Like, I'm just going to create a bunch of really useful stuff on my protocol. People are going to come on my protocol, use the stuff and it's gated in my asset. But mm -hmm. as soon as you're like, okay, I actually want people on other protocols to use my asset. You don't have that same lock-in. So I'm just, I'm like a little bit unclear on what the overall playbook is going to be in order to, how, you, how do you convince people on other rollups where you don't have that lock-in to want to use and hold your thing? I mean, th that's like one argument for the L2 approach versus the monolithic approach, right? Where it's like, in in my mind, um, you know, you can have a bajillion TPS, you can drive fees to zero. Um, let's just say I'm at like a monolithic protocol, whatever you want to call it. Um, at the end of the day, when I have an app that gets big enough, they're going to be like, I want my own app chain, or I want my own X, or I want my own Y. Like, Keeping uh, value in your ecosystem is not a technical problem. It's an incentive alignment problem. And every mm. single chain and every single, it doesn't matter how it's constructed or what the virtual machine is, like every single chain will experience this. A game blows up on your ecosystem. How do you, how do you get them to stay when selling block space is arguably another, you know, one X of revenue to them. And, you know, or at least like, how do you capture value? from that as an ecosystem. And I think one way is like you can extract fees from them and try to just like keep them on your chain. Like I don't, I don't think that's going to work long term. I think the other way is like you establish your asset as money and as the money that people want to use in this game or in this market or in this app or whatever. And so like I see all this ETH being bridged to like even places like Say or Sui or you know Solana or the L2s and it's like sure that that those ETH um you know, they will generate fees for the main chain whenever people mint or withdraw from that L2 or that other chain. But the value that you gain from the monetary premium of that asset getting exported, in my mind, like more than makes up for any of the lost fees of that ETH not being on the main chain anymore, like whatever. Um, and like a lot of this philosophy stems from, I think money is the most interesting and biggest market for like the large scale crypto assets. Um, and bootstrapping a monetary premium is extraordinarily hard. And that's just like one way that you can do it. And so like at the end of the day, I think fees are a means to an end. For me, like high fees on ETH L1, bootstrap its denomination as money. Eventually the fees get so high that people want to deploy L2s or like the incentives are just there. Like we've seen like a thousand rollups raising, like, you know, people just want to go launch their own thing and, and have their own token. That's cool. All of them are running points programs, trying to get ETH onto their blockchain. Like that monetary premium is in my mind, like the most important thing. Um, Cause like, you know, the fees on a salon or the fees on a polygon or the fees on, you know, whatever, like you cannot justify the valuation of a lot of these things if they are not money. I, I agree with that. I think my, my broad perspective on this, like at a 10,000 foot view has been, we're going to see the return of commodity like money. I think there are going to be multiple commodity like monies that compete, but I think the playbook for competing is kind of if your mental model is as kind of like an operating system uh, that generates profits, that's very different from competing as a money, actually. And I do think Ethereum has a really good advantage there. And actually, one one thing I've been thinking about that's really bullish rollups is if you think about the ETH ro roadmap as it stands, there's all of this TVL on L1 and all of this activity still. But I think, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the objective is to push most of that up to rollups. So, you know, like the TVL of rollups is just going to, I mean, it's theoretically going to grow by what? Maybe they won't be totally successful and get all of the TVL off. ETH is probably not desirable. There's probably a lot of people that really like the security assurances of just keeping their stuff on L1. So, but, you know, however you slice it, there's probably 10 to $20 billion worth of TVL, you know, before there's any asset price appreciation that's just going to migrate up 
to the L2s. I think one of the things I've been curious about is who's going to get the lion's share of that. I feel like it's very bullish arbitrum and optimism, actually. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, we're, we're holders of optimism. So again, we have bags, but it's like it's been more bullish arbitrum than optimism. Like this is crazy. I, I mean, this this number is probably a little dated, but I think Arbitrum has one and a half million ETH in its bridge. That's so much. That's yeah. crazy. Like, that's real. We're talking about real money. We are. Well, the the other difference though between Arbitrum and Optimism has been the incentives that Optimism has paid out versus how much Arbitrum has paid out. And you know, as a lover of Arbitrum, I do look at they did something called the Step Short Term Incentive Program. You know. The hundreds of millions of dollars that they're paying out that are probably go that are going to DApps on the on Arbitrum's chain and then probably just getting dumped. And now there's like uh, LTIP, you know, long term incentive program, which implies to me that this is going to be a constant thing. I this was an old stat, but I think Hasu a little while ago we talked about it on the show tweeted out the amount of incentives that various uh, you know DYDX had paid out, Arbitrum, Optimism, out uh, Lido, big chains. It was like I think I don't want to misspeak here, but. Optimism was in the neighborhood of like 200 million and Arbitrum was like 1.4 billion. So there's a massive difference in terms of wow. issuance policy. I yeah. did not, I did so, not realize that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like there, there is this thing where again, like we see all these L2 pitches where it's like, we're going to launch an L2. All right. What's, what's step two? Well, we're going to do this points program or giveaway tokens to get TVL on the chain. It's like, okay, which, which ecosystem are you going to target to bring TVL over? And you know, frankly, like ETH is the only asset that is big enough to move the needle for any of these L2s that are launching. Like as much as a lot of them may want to go at, like Solana is like kind of the next obvious candidate, but it is like an order of magnitude smaller in terms of like the capital that's willing to move across chains. Because like a lot of the whole thing with Solana too is like the capital stays on Solana. It's one chain, one team, one dream, you know, the, the assets don't move. So it's like, I don't know if I if I think about it like there's just a lot of sources for yield for ETH because it's like you could go to this L2 and earn points, you could go restake it in eigenlayer and, and earn you know tokens or points or whatever, um, but that is the asset that people are targeting and and I think that is kind of glossed over, and I, I think ecosystems will be known for different things, like mm. you know Bitcoin is digital gold obviously ETH I think is just like money. Uh, you know, I think like, I think like things like IMX or Ronin, you know, they have a shit ton of users, um, but they don't generate like a ton of economic value. Not yet. I think the long term is like, you know, you have a lot of users that generate a lot of economic net value right now. It's just like, there's a lot of users. There's like not that much economic value. So each of these things will have a, a part to play, but like, I do think the assets that are money are going to just be, they're, they're obviously going to be used differently, but I think they will be valued differently as well. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I, I think that is a challenge that Solana is going to have to face ultimately. And maybe we can use this as a, a jumping off point to talk a little bit about Jupiter. So Jupiter had a, a pretty massive airdrop, I would, I would say this week is something to the tune of uh, 700 million. You know, we can, uh, in terms of that, they're actually spreading out the airdrop quite a bit. It's over a period of like three years or something like that. They're, they're going to essentially do multiple successive airdrops and, um, you know, Jupiter, for those of you who are, aren't are less familiar, it's they're an aggregator. So aggregators have been much more successful in Solana in general. Again, I don't this is my opinion, but it's because it's because of fees, you know, like one inch and uh shoot, there's another aggregator. But like it the reason why it's more difficult on Ethereum is because if you're one inch, you know, you ultimately have to make multiple different hops and the gas costs of doing that are just kind of punitive so it makes more sense to trade where all the, li the liquidity is on uniswap anyway whereas in solana gas fees are much more cheap so there is actually a lot of value to routing across multiple different dexes um I, i'd be curious fans in general like what you thought of the airdrop I, I do think it's you know as a criticism of solana here maybe a constructive criticism you know there definitely are i think the strains um are starting to show a little bit there were a bunch of transactions that ultimately are kind of starting to fail and and I think the the primary reason there is that they don't have a very robust fee market. There are a lot of changes that need to that need to be made. And you know, ultimately the UX isn't really it doesn't really impact the UX that much because transactions happen so fast and they're so cheap. But like you could have like two or three failed transactions in a row, which kind of sucks. But yeah, what did what did you think overall about the the Jupiter airdrop? Yeah, I mean, 
like every, every no blockchain is solved. ETH is not solved. This pro, like, you know, the, uh, the fee issue, you know, Solana has some, you know, transaction failing issues. Like all the L2s have issues. Like nobody's really figured this out. And I think to say otherwise is just kind of being dishonest. So like, I don't, I don't think it's like a huge knock on Solana, but there's obviously just like work to do. Uh, that's okay. Um, and there were a lot of failed transactions just cause there was so much interest, which is great for Solana. Um, Dflow was the only aggregator that was still up and, and processing transactions cause they had an order flow model, which is kind of interesting. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, now Solana, I, I think has had, um, most of the major airdrops that are going to happen, um, and like Dflow has not, but like most of the major airdrops have happened that were going to happen. Um, and now it's kind of like a what next moment. And I think what, what is next is like increasing liquid staking participation to try to drive some of that monetary premium. And like the Gito soul chart is nuts in terms of the supply. It's just like up only. It's a new all-time high right. every day. So I think that's like a really good auger for what's going to go on. Um, you obviously have all the DeFi primitives being built out as well with margin fi and, and, and all that stuff. Um, like I have less to say on the Jupiter airdrop. Like I did think that, you know, I don't even know. Did they raise like 300 million or something? There is a lot. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of with you. It was, I mean, look, Jupiter is a great protocol. Um, I think they have super ambitious plans for what they want to do from a product suite standpoint. I, I, I'm i kind of with you. It, it was great. I'm rooting for the team. I, I always blank on how to pronounce the the founder's name, wear me out or whatever, but I'm really happy for the team and I thought they executed it well. Solana held up reason, reasonably well as a network. Uh, I think it's trading at like a five and a half billion dollar FDV right now. Um, I saw some people kind of extrapolating. What I'd be curious, like Vance, what do you think about this? Sometimes when people will be like, "Oh, you know, this this newly launched token is trading at this value," like this is how the market is valuing it, and I'm just like, "Is anyone really valuing this, or is this just trading off of like pure sentiment and momentum?" Like I, I don't know. I I would push back a little bit. The obvious one is it's the same valuation as Uniswap. And oh, yeah, maybe yeah. that maybe that was engineered or or maybe it was an accident, but like I, I guess there is an argument to make there. Um the the only problem I have with it is like look, raising three hundred million dollars is like a lot of money. And then, you know, the other sixty million that they paid to use the launch pad, like I do think there are some Solana projects who've done the airdrops correctly. Again, bias, but like Gito, just giving it away to the most loyal, to the most pe the people who use it the most. I do think there is a knock on some Solana ecosystem projects from the last cycle of like, you know, some people just like went for the cash grab and not saying Jupiter was that, but like when you raise $360 million, it's like, you know, are you in it for the community? Are you in it for the tech? Like, like what, what happens next? Where does that money get used? Um, it's just weird. I, I've never seen that before other than like yeah. the big ICOs of 2017. Yeah. I think the, the one airdrop that I would still be, looking out for is uh tensor as well there might be a couple yeah. of those i'm sort of forgetting yeah but tensor I'm, I'm i'm sure the other ones are going to be valuable as well but you know like after DeFi summer it's like okay cool time to go build all this shit and like scale the ecosystem up another 10x and i agree. I, I think the um you know like there's a lot of other ecosystems that are going to have their moment in the sun and for a while last year, it felt like the game that everyone was going to play was like Solana was going to catch ETH. I think now the game that people are playing, at least like, you know, what I'm thinking from a venture perspective is like, shit, Solana's worth, you know, $50 billion. Like maybe funding some of the other old L1s or old L2s, like they can, they can catch Solana. And so I think it's like, okay, cool. Like all the cake and punch and pie has been handed out. And now it's just like time to really build apps. Um, and prove that the monolithic thesis works but yeah you know they've got like a great community of builders so i don't think it's impossible i've i've i was never a proponent of the idea that solana could catch eth i definitely thought it was really undervalued at a certain point but i've just it's just going to be hard to make the call on what would make that happen because i've never seen that happen before you know people have been calling for the eth flipping of bitcoin forever has it really happened? The lead is starting to get narrowed a little bit by Bitcoin. Generally, any flipping calls are extremely bearish for that asset. And I've done this too before where I'm like, ETH is flipping Bitcoin in six months. And then it's like, okay, now ETH BTC is down 20%. Um, 
I think yeah. it's just like, you know, some of the best advice that I've ever gotten is just be very careful with your victory laps. Yep. I think that's a really good point. And if people are looking out, like there is, there's so much exciting stuff going on in, in these ecosystems. I would say like Sui, I think has been a relatively slept on, uh, new L1, which I find super interesting. Obviously we've been talking about Celestia, uh, even some of the stuff with near I'm interviewing, uh, Ilya Polishkin and they, they have a lot of stuff going on. So I think one of their challenges is going to be creating a cohesive narrative around it, but they have this thing called the blockchain operating system, which is, you know, a lot of especially L1s are very focused on what I would call like the back end, like what we're describing, like base layer, you know, very safe, decentralized, secure money, like properties as its asset, but they've created essentially a framework for hosting decentralized front ends. And like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. And they have these things called multi-chain accounts where it's kind of like how ICAs work, where you can, do, you can custody your assets with near, you can essentially use a near validator as an MPC signer and they can, you know, sort of remotely broadcast transactions that'll get executed on Bitcoin or ETH or whatever. Anyway, I, I have I have no like strong opinion on how any of this stuff plays out, but there's a lot of cool stuff happening. There are a lot of cool experiments being run. And I don't know. I think one of the other things that'll be different about this cycle is we actually have cheap block space that's useful. People have always said, oh, there's all this cheap block space all over the place, but it was on shitty L1s that no one wanted to do anything on. And now you've got rollups, you've got Solana, you've got Sovereign rollups on Celestia, but wherever. I, and I think it'll just be, I think people are going to do some very cool stuff from a product standpoint that people are sleeping on. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, like I was at this conference, I think two weekends ago, and I was sitting with these people and they're like, you know, ETH is in a very precarious position and like, you know, Solana is going to flip it. And like, look, this is not like, you know, to trigger Solana people, but it's like, okay, well, ETH has one guy chasing it and there's like a $200 billion market cap gap. Solana has like a hundred people chasing it like there's just like to your point there's a lot of cheap block space there's a lot of ecosystems with different approaches ultimately i think how this shakes out is like who has the best app strategy for their chain and the ability to pe keep people on a chain and like if one of these gaming chains has you know 10 million monthly active users it's like okay well i guess that gets to be a top you know 10 chain whatever um yeah. but like there, there's just going to be a lot of jockeying it feels like for probably third place like it feels like that just just my perspective like it's like that's where the money is going to be made yeah you know, who, get, who gets to be the next 50 billion dollar protocol that goes from you know a billion today to 50 tomorrow um like you know and it's not going to be liquid in the same way that an ether or bitcoin is and like you can't pull like a billion dollars out of that maybe you could but like that 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 like is where my sense of like where the money is going to be made yeah. And just a last note on the Solana fee thing. Didn't mean that as a knock on Solana, but I do think as a, again, one of my predictions for this year is that they're going to do their own 1559. There's a great uh, resource for those of you who are interested called Umber Research, which I believe is a mashup between Ellipsis. So they're the lab team behind Phoenix and uh, Gito. Uh, so Lucas has written a couple pieces on there. Eugene has written a couple pieces on there. And there was a, a piece that just came out by uh, Eugene uh, at Ellipsis and Theo Demondis, uh, who's done a lot of really great work on fee markets. He works at Bain Capital. Um, and then, the, so the title of the piece is Toward Multidimensional Solana Fees. So we can link it in the show notes if there are any MEV or fee market nerds. I actually almost did the whole next season of Belker on fee markets. I thought it's a super interesting topic. So uh, yep. I'll be curious to see what Solana ends up doing with that. Hey everyone, wanted to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Flood Protocol, the Optimal Dex Aggregator. Now, Flood is the perfect partner for this episode on the multi-chain future because Flood is solving so many of the issues that we're going to be talking about this season. And this is relevant for both traders and devs. So if you are a trader, you should definitely head over to FloodSwap and start trading because they solve three massive problems. One, gasless trading. No more pesky trading fees. Two, you don't have to worry about getting front run. MEV free. And then three, they have excellent order routing so that you know that you are getting the best price. So head over to FloodSwap and click the link in the bottom of the show notes. We're going to send you right there. For the devs out there, you can leverage Flood's flexible hooks, allowing you to make swapping a first class primitive by adding custom order types like TWAPs. Or if you're a wallet builder or something like that, you can actually build your own order flow auction in and start recapturing a bunch of that MEV. If you want to reach out to them, go to devs at flood.bid or just jump right in the Discord. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Appreciate you, Flood. Maybe to close, just as like more of a fun, riffy sort of topic, you know, Vitalik wrote a piece. He actually wrote two pieces. I haven't written, I haven't read the second one on 
the end of his childhood. I wonder if that's an Arthur C. Clarke. I, did he just turn 30? I actually should have I think, that, he, yeah, he just turned 30. So happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah, I just turned 32. So, uh, wow. yeah, me and Vitalik, basically, uh, <laughs> basically the same guy. Uh, basically the same guy. Yeah. Um, but he, he also wrote a, a really interesting piece, I thought, on AI and crypto. And I'd be curious to get your take on this. He, he put AI in four categories and, I don't really want to go through each one because that's just going to end up being a list. But basically, he went through all of these different models of how AI and crypto could overlap. And, you know, they ranged from on the spectrum of AI is kind of a, a judge or a rule setter uh, in terms of decentralized crypto systems. If it's uh, like a way like crypto is a way to build better AI models all the way on the other side. Or if crypto is a participant, you know, alongside humans within the context of crypto. And, you know, I think he showed that he was excited about it. But I, I ultimately got like a pretty cautious vibe on the combination of AI and and crypto. So I would just be curious to get your take. I always love reading what he has to say. I, I think my like my take is probably the most practical um, where like for something like a maker that's a revenue generating business that like needs little human intervention like what if we turn that over to ai governance and just said like look goal seek for profit um you know within these risk parameters ready set go like it feels like that's an evolution of dow tools that could really be helpful for a lot of projects that are like more mature like think about uniswap with the fee switch you know turn it on and and give it to the ai and say like what fees should be set on each of these markets and you know like try to remove the meat space you know interaction from humans um I think there's a lot of AI stuff that that's beyond that. That's like a little bit more like you need to squint to see it. Like I saw some people saying that, you know, you could, you know, prove whether AI or, you know, whether Taylor Swift's nudes are real or fake on a blockchain. It's like, I don't know how the blockchain would tell, you know, better than a server. There's also kind of like, you know, you can put the proofs of models that run and making sure that ChatGPT 4.5 actually ran your, your query instead of ChatGPT 4. I think that is potential, um, but we'll, like we'll see. It's like very speculative. I I, I think like it's going to be more of a narrative than a use case for a while. But you know, people like you know games especially have potentially more use case of this. Like AI Arena um, is building a game where you know you train an AI and then the AI actually plays for you and you kind of accrue value by building up this ever changing AI model, which you can then you know earn rewards, sell you know do, do different things with on chain be like that that's like another one but you know we'll see I, I think it's like people want the narrative to happen i think there's a couple of use cases where it could but i don't think we need to be worried about like a terminator scenario at any point in the next you know few years yeah i have i feel like i've got no unique perspective on ai and how much you should be worried about it but yeah. i i am i am interested to see like at the very least you know this is the collective thought of our analysts but i agree i do feel like there is the potential for a massive narrative combination of you can, oh, yeah. you can imagine a world where like crypto and ai take off together and it's like oh my god you know i mean the world um, is changing yep yeah yeah so who knows there is there was a uh, i'm gonna blank on the name but there's a guy named anish uh who agnihotri who came on here during the mev season um really bright guy he anyway i think he went over to this company called ritual um which is another like one of the early polychain guys and yeah. When they, when they launched that, I was like, that's worth looking at because, you know, Anish has been at very senior, like, gone to crypto when he was 11 years old and he's like worked at Polychain and these super impressive D places. Dude's like, a genius. Straight yeah, up. Straight up. Um, so it's like, okay, it is definitely something here. And I know multi chain's pretty bullish on it. So something to work, something to watch, I would say. Something to watch. It, but, yeah. If he says something, it's generally, you know, probably worth watching slash correct. I, I just yeah. like, I'm not in the weeds enough to know what what AI is going to do. How, Vance, how much out of curiosity would you say, like crypto has become so much more diverse? Like, how do you structure knowledge even within framework? Like, how much would you say you personally are like I'm in the weeds on this and I grok it? Versus how much are you relying on analysts at this point? It's just so hard to keep up with every little nuance of this ecosystem anymore. I mean. I, I find it pretty easy, but like, mm. you know, I know what Bitcoin and ETH are. I know what the ETF chatter is, right? 
I have a very instinctual understanding of DeFi because I've been doing it literally forever. Gaming is like more of a moving target where I like have less of an idea what I'm doing, but I have a strong thesis on the space that I built up over time. And then like, you know, the AI stuff and, and um, you know, kind of more of the speculative like infrastructure plays. Like, I, I just try to, you know, put analysts on it and, and cover it from that perspective. Because, like, once it becomes investable, I want to be there. But um, at this point, the fund is of a size that, like, we can't make $400, $1 million deep instead of a $400 million fund. So, you know, you're, you're also constrained by what your size and strategy is. But, like, there's a bunch of, like, I think potentially promising smaller funds that are, like, we're just doing parallel block, parallelized blockchains. We're just doing AI and crypto. It's like, you know, if it, if it hits, they're going to be huge. Um, but like, if it doesn't, you know, it's going to go to zero. So like that, that's kind of the risk you run with being more concentrated and, and focused on emerging areas. But we can play a little bit later than that, which is fortunate for us. Yeah. All right, buddy. This was a really fun one. Um, I think we can probably end it here. And Or is there anything else you wanted to chat about? That's it. This is a good one. Cool. All right, partner. Later, buddy. Have a good one. Peace. See ya. Hey, everyone. Mike here. If you're a Bell Curve listener, you know that transferring assets across chains can be a massive pain. I certainly do. I complain about it on this program all the time. That is why we are incredibly excited to have teamed up with the Wormhole Foundation, the stewards of the Wormhole Protocol. And the coolest part about this particular partnership is that they have made custom bell curve nfts which you can get and mint for free so click the link at the bottom of this episode take you get your free nft